you're on this video, chances are you're a VCE Maths Method student looking to score max. While I can't be your example of a row 50, what I will do is show you everything that got me a row 48 in 2024. I'm talking sack marks, moderation, exam marks, mistakes, and this is all coming from someone who never felt very naturally apt at maths, so if I can, you definitely can as well. Also, a quick apology that has taken me so long to put out this methods video, despite it being my most requested video. It's been really hectic recently, but I promise I see you all subscribing, I'm very grateful and planning out all those videos on the subjects that you've asked me for. Also, don't mind the bare ears that kind of just glued to my head at this point. With that said, let's go open my statement of marks for methods. Also, guess who's officially old now? I thought it would never happen. It felt bittersweet, but at least I have the Sanrio haul for my friends to cheer me up, plus lots more. I mean, friends, cute things, views, what more could you ask for? Okay guys, I know I called this section sax and scaling, but as you can see here, there wasn't actually any scaling because my school submitted my SAC average as 100% and Vika didn't scale it down, thankfully, so it's still 100%. As you will know, in maths methods and further, the SACs only contribute 34% of your study score, but I will say I think my SACs probably carried me even if they don't contribute that much because as you can see, that's 100%, whereas um, with my exams, it looks like I've dropped a total of five marks across the two exams. And we'll get into where those marks were dropped. Exam 1, I lost three marks alone, and that's from questions 5b and one mark off of question 7c. Okay, this one's just embarrassing. I've always had transformations as that one area of weakness, and I was one of the people that tried dilating from the y-axis instead of from the t-axis like you were supposed to. What I would say to you as a student is, if you know that you have those areas of weakness, spend those few hours of targeted revision just on that area instead of just grinding um, practice exams, which are a mix of all topics. 7c was that one mistake you should never make that Vika was trying to blindside a lot of people with where you do not graph the endpoints of the derivative function with the closed circles. Now I'm pulling up the statement of marks for the multiple choice of exam 2. As you can see, it's 20 out of 20, so I don't think I have much to say there, but ask if you had questions about any of those multiple choice questions. Next page is exam 2 short answer. I can't see any marks lost here, so they must be on the next page. And we can see one mark lost here and here. I don't quite remember what I wrote here, but I believe it was a rounding error because if you remember, the question right before had some numbers that were not so pretty. Can you believe the only other mark lost was also a rounding error where I, I think I just kept it at 10 to 40 instead of rounding it to 11 to 39. So I cannot stress enough the importance of, I guess, reading through everything and um, thinking through your rounding in a practical sense, like what, what makes sense in this situation. Just as I said in the specialist video, sacks are important. So there are people who have lost less marks than me over the two exams, like maybe they lost only three or four marks, but they still got a lower study score than me. You know what the difference was? Their sack scores. Okay, so don't underestimate how big of a difference a really good ranking and that 100% average in sacks that I had made. So I would definitely spend your year in the right mindset putting priority on your sacks instead of telling yourself that you'll just clutch up in the exam. Two general rules to follow to get top marks in investigation style sacks. Number one is to yap as much as you can, as I've said in another video. So if your school gives you three pages of empty space, try to get at least two and a half pages and have a lot of writing in there. That's part of the marking scheme as well. They want you to present it nicely, draw big graphs, and write detailed explanations that shows some kind of understanding of whether it's transformations or um, the properties of this type of graph. If you yap as much as you can, you're hitting those depth marks. And rule number two is always to choose the path of least resistance. That means when you get those questions to come up with a function that fits these parameters, you make the simplest possible function. Don't go a power higher than you have to. Don't make something that has weird dilation factors when simpler numbers could work. It'll also make it nicer for the for the marker. It's nicer for them to check, nicer for them to look at. And I'll give you an example. For a hyperbola investigation in a sack that I did, I chose numbers so simple that when we got out, literally I asked my friends and no one else did the same numbers as me, even though to me it was the most obvious thing. I think I literally just 
took the original function that we were working with before and I halved the dilation factors. I just halved the numbers and I got a really simple function that just happened to fit the parameters, even if the function itself may have looked weird. Because I used simple numbers, it met all the requirements and it made my life so much easier. Whereas everyone else was choosing more creative numbers and then struggling and taking more time and then getting the wrong asymptotes. So work smarter, not harder. When it comes to reference books, this is just my recommendation, but don't buy one or just use your textbook. So 9 out of 10 people will not touch their reference books in their SAC or exam. So the whole point of a reference book is the exercise of making one. It's a revision method for your brain to help you remember. So if you buy one or just bring in your textbook, that defeats the purpose. And it doesn't have to be something that you write out entirely by hand. So myself, I made my reference book digitally in Microsoft Word because then I could format it really aesthetically because for me, I needed my notes to be aesthetic so that I was you know, motivated to reread them a lot and commit them to memory. And I did the same thing, um, the same kind of formatting for my legal notes, which are in my link tree if you want to purchase them. They are really aesthetic, trust me. And basically, I used Microsoft Word for my reference book because it has this amazing ink equation function where you can write out the formulas, the maths, and it all looks really neat and uniform. Okay, this one's a little controversial and just up to personal preference, but maybe consider not doing multiple choice first. I totally understand the reasons for why everyone recommends that you do it first, and that includes that it's the easiest, fastest section, so for a lot of people, they feel good when they start with that easier section and then breeze through it. Um, typically, they recommend you clear it in the first 20 minutes and then go on to short answer. However, I have never once started with multiple choice when it came to my maths exams, and I got 20 out of 20 for mine. So clearly there's no hard and fast universal rule. Now hear me out. Section B short answer is designed so that you can clear it within 45 to 55 minutes max. Okay, so it's the bulkier part of the exam, and multiple choice is just this smaller part that you can do much faster. So why don't you attack the biggest, heaviest part of the exam while you're still at your peak energy? Listen to me, anyone who tells you you need to start with MC has never felt the relief of clearing your big section B in 45 minutes and then having much over an hour to do your multiple choice and do lots of double checking over your exam, okay? It's an amazing feeling because that way when I got to MCQ, it wasn't something that I had to quickly rush. I still had so much time by then, so I could take a lot of time with each question to do it properly, check through all the options, and that's how I got 20 out of 20 for that section. So relief and time management is one thing, but there's actually a second really practical reason for why you should start with section B instead, and that's for the variables stored on your calculator. If you start with multiple choice, that's 20 questions, 20 different functions with their own variables, you're going to get to the end of multiple choice and you still have all of section B to go with all its variables, but your calculator will already be filled up, all those variables and your graphing screens all filled up and you'll have to take some time to clear it and clean it up so that you can get to section B with a clean slate. Think about it like this, if you start with section B, that way I always, I would designate F to this function, G to this function, the way the question nominated it. It makes it really easy for me to work cleanly through section B. And then by the end, when I had so much time to do MCQ, I can just assign whatever random variable names to um, each of those 20 questions, you know, like something could be F20 by then. I don't even care because it's not as important to have clearly assigned variables as it is in section B. So that's another really good reason why you should start with section B. Don't underestimate how quickly it can take for your brain to get fatigued when you're in the actual final exam. Look, that's just my case, but if anyone would like to comment on why they think it's better to still start with MCQ as is done traditionally, then please do comment and I would love to hear all your reasons and the benefits for you. But yeah, moving on. This was my order of exam completion optimized for success. So during reading time, spend a lot of time on section B, just 
a bit of time on MCQ so that the moment they said start, I could already circle the answers for like five MCQ questions on my answer sheet because I already worked it out and memorized the answer in my head during reading time. But then instead of starting with MCQ, I would then jump to section B and spend a good time carefully doing that, um, get it cleared in ideally 45 minutes, and then I can take my time on MCQ and lots and lots of double, triple, quadruple checking. And that's how I got the scores that I did. More time-saving tips, when you start your exam, don't bother highlighting when you could just be circling or underlining really thickly with your greylet. Don't take that extra time to switch over to another piece of stationery. This is a really great time-saving tip. Use a Texas Instruments calculator. And if you currently have a Casio class pad, then get a Texas Instruments calculator, a much faster and much more powerful processor. It can graph things so much quicker. I remember in our investigation group sacks, my friends literally, they they had to wait for me to get up to their part and help them through the, the really graphing intensive questions because their own Casio class pads were taking like a full minute to like buffer and load up the next graph and like a full minute to just zoom in to like a circle graph whereas mine is just like instant right do you know i started my vce in a casio class pet school i had just moved from a school that used the ti so i was just there with my blue and black ti everyone else had their white class pads i was like the odd one out and no one could help me and then guess what two to three months before the final exam in year 12 suddenly left and right around me people were switching to the texas instruments calculator even my uh, own friend who spent the past few years like she would laugh a lot at my blue texas and then she got a blue texas as well because there is literally no better time saver than a fast calculator and also please use a gray lead or mechanical pencil in your exam like i had a friend who used bright blue pen on all their exams i don't quite understand it's just keep it safer for yourself and use something you can easily erase common question is how many practice exams do you need to do and just like the amount of hours of study that you put in each night there is no fixed or magic number so i think i did 22 exam ones and 22 exam twos but i didn't do as many practice exams for any of my other subjects and i still scored like same scores or even higher so once again like i said in the specialist video the important part of that is that you put these in a spreadsheet or somewhere where you can log your mistakes and what you will be watching out for in the actual thing. The last thing I will cover for today is, do you need a tutor for methods? To which I say, you don't ever need a tutor, but it can be worthwhile in this subject. To explain, I went my 12 years of schooling without any tutoring because I'm not rich and I, I had enough self-discipline to study for tests and pass entrance exams on my own. However, after I accelerated methods 1-2, I was forced by my school to wait until year 12 to take 3-4, despite being in top 5. Um, and don't ask why, okay? They, they said... They said to us that research shows it's a bad thing to take methods early or something, even though it's it's really common in many schools. But look, that aside, after that gap year that forced hiatus from methods, I felt really anxious that A, I'd fallen out of touch with the content, B, the study design had changed in the year that I was off it, and C, I was the only TI Inspire user in a school that used Casio Classpad, so no one could help me when I had tech issues. So with these reasons, I made a pretty convincing case to my parents to get tutoring for the first time ever for Methods 3-4 um, for a few months in my final year. My other subjects, it didn't feel needed, but I knew I would gain a lot from going to a center for Methods with that like fast-track teaching, Texas support, and resources. So my advice is just see if you can come up with solid reasons why you'll benefit from tutoring. My own tutor was amazing, all the tutors there were, and I got the calculator help that I couldn't get at school, and that was the most important thing to me. Thanks for getting this far, and please do sub if you haven't yet. I am working on other subjects, including English, chemistry, and legal, which I did get a raw 50 in. And look, I definitely haven't covered the entire subject. If you have any questions about methods, please just comment below, and I will get back to you ASAP. And to all of you who are returning to school right now, best of luck.